Well, welcome to Let's Talk Motorsport for yet another week. It's Wednesday night, 8 o'clock, so we must be in your lounge rooms, hopefully, or wherever you're watching on a device. Uh, thanks for all the feedback we've been getting. Again, it's very positive and makes us do uh, things even better uh, as we move on in this uh, game. Five episodes in and plenty more to come. And uh, also from this week, we'll be broadcasting on Facebook Live as well. So there's another avenue to get to. And we're also looking at other avenues, maybe back on uh, some form of commercial television as well that we're talking to. So things are moving along nicely. And to keep you part of the conversation, don't be scared to put in some uh, comments, questions, uh, even comments on what we're talking about during the course of the show. And this week's show, going a little bit back in time, I suppose, there's been a couple of good classic meetings at Phillip Island in the last couple of months. The first one, the, the International Island Classic for Motorbikes. And just recently, last week, in fact, the uh, 31st running of the Phillip Island uh, Classic for International for, uh, Festival of Motorsport there for the cars, for the four-wheelers. And uh, what a great weekend it was. 450 entries or something, all sorts of machinery. You couldn't, you know, it's every um, motorhead's dream to get to something like that, especially when you like seeing a bit of history. And it was a bit of history with the um, Festival of Nostalgia at uh, Phillip Island this weekend. And uh, joining me again this week, um, Sam Diamond, who was racing down there in a trusty little Lola on the weekend. And thanks for joining us You're after welcome. what was a he hectic weekend for everybody, I think. It was a very busy weekend. Had a good time, though. You haven't yeah, got yeah, a smile off your face. Oh, no. Can you get, when, you're a good, when you're down there racing at that beautiful <laughs> place, how can you not smile? And the weather was pretty good for it, too. Uh, on the Friday, it was a little ordinary. It was a bit of a, a few showers that made the track pretty slippery for everyone's qualifying on Friday morning. And, yeah, it was um, a bit. Yeah, there's a few of the lads got a bit, little bit excited when yes, they didn't have to. Yes, they did. Um, and it spined up from there, and Saturday and Sunday were beautiful days. Sunday was beautiful, except for that wind that came up in the afternoon. Oh, yeah, it felt did it that, in the car too. Did that have any effect on the little yeah, lightweight lava? Yeah, as soon as you sort of go down the straight and you get past the walls under the bridge, yeah, yeah it just comes straight across and gives you the car a fair shunt over to the right. Yeah, you don't want it, it doesn't want to make it let you turn too easily. No, no. Um, before we get into talking about Sam and the weekend overall, let's have a look or in an interview with the guy that's been responsible for the event for the last 25 or 26 years, Ian Tate. He's got a great history in uh, motor racing, was actually one of the head mechanics for Harry Firth and the Holden Dealer team way back then. Uh, we'll get him on the show later on to talk about all those days and uh, a bit of controversy and everything that happened on the tracks at Bathurst and all that, the birth of all that racing that um, so many people still hold dear to them. So let's have a catch up with Ian Tate who like I said has been responsible for the meeting for the last 25 years. Well, Ian Tate, uh, director of this uh, Phillip Island Classic, Car Classic, well done on another fantastic meeting. Look, uh, the weather's been really challenging but it's turned out beautiful this afternoon. I think the weather's going to be great for the weekend but uh, we're looking forward to some fantastic racing over the weekend. Now you've been involved with this event for over a quarter of a century, what changes have you seen? Uh, look, we started off pretty small in the, in the early days. We had 220 entries. We thought it was fantastic. But we realised if we didn't move ahead, uh, we could fall over. The, you, you've got to improve the meeting all the time. And we went out purposely to, to build the meeting up and to include overseas guests coming here and to build the meeting up that way. And now we've been recognised around the world as one of the top six race meetings in the world. So the, the Octane magazine in, in England runs a... a, a uh, thing every year for different race meetings, different uh, sh car shows and whatever, and we've been in the top six four years. So we're recognised around the world, that's what we wanted to do, is to lift the profile of the meeting, and now we've got guys coming from America, England, uh, Formula Ford guys are coming from France, Holland, um, Belgium and England. Adrian Reynard's coming out here, he's racing this weekend. He built the Reynard race cars and Formula One cars and Indy cars, and the Formula 3 thousands, along with his, another guy racing here, Malcolm Osler. Malcolm helped build, he was a designer for Adrian Reynard. You've got these guys out here. We've got Larry Perkins, a patron of the meeting. He built his own race cars. He could build them, he could design them, build them, and race them and win and drive them home again. You know, he's a fantastic operator. 
So by saying that, the size of the meeting, you'll be already organising next year's meeting with this meeting still running, wouldn't you? We are. <laughs> There's a couple of plans there. What we're trying to do next year is get... This year we should have 5,000. Uh, that's every second year we have a, a 5,000. This year uh, they fell over a little bit. We didn't quite have the numbers here this year in Australia. And New Zealand weren't... We usually get a, a couple of containers or three containers from New Zealand. Uh, they're in a bit of a doldrum at the moment with, with uh, cars and as a result they're in 10 or 11 cars. So they're in trouble at, at, at the same time as us with economy and whatever. So next year we're concentrating on 5,000 and we want at least 30, 35, 5,000. We're trying, we're approaching England, we're approaching um, America and probably New Zealand to get them up to gear. Well, we want at least 35,000 next year. Well, there was a, um, a couple of years ago you had a good turnout of Formula 5,000. We did. Like a couple of years ago, we had a guy from New Zealand called Ken Smith. I think he's probably 74, 75 now. And he came over here and beat two of our low hot shots. And they're the quickest Formula 5,000 driver in Australia. He beat them. Not a bad effort for an old bloke. Not an effort, is it? And he's about... Five foot ring uh, tall, and he's about three stone ring and wet. It's not the, he's incredible for his age. Not the size of the fight in the dock. It is not the fight. No, it's dead right. How many people have actually got involved in this meeting during the course of the year to make sure, you know, like officials, they don't, well, they're all volunteers? Everyone volunteers. I have a working committee for, on our race committee of about 25. And um, over the weekend, today we'll have about 170 officials. Tomorrow about 2.20, about 2.40 on Sunday. And they're the guys that make it happen. No one's paid. We, we, we volunteer our time to make it happen. And it must be good to have someone like Burson's on board again as well. We are very privileged to have Burson's. They're, they're a sponsor this year and also a naming right, as they have been for the last three years. But most importantly, we've got Penrod and, and Shannon's, and they've been with us from the first race meeting. For 31 years, those two sponsors have been with us. But we've got... A lot of other small sponsors. We got Bendix Brakes for the first year this year. We got Holden for giving us six cars. We've got other VACC are very strong with us. Uh, they're being supported, but they're all the sponsors in their program. They take a page in the program. They make it happen. Well, mate, all the best, and hopefully you're doing it for a lot more years to come. With a bit of luck, yes. Look forward to it. Thanks very much. Uh, he's a good man, very passionate, and that goes to show, um, reflected in the level of event that it has. And uh, those cars, Sam, looking at them, like the one race that there was just, I think it was 30 seconds, they meandered their way, well, not meandered their way, raced their way over Lukey Heights and uh, through um, Turn 10 and MG. It just went on forever. There's about 50 cars in that one race. Yeah, it was Formula Ford. I think they had a grid, full grid of 58 cars, and they had 12 on the, wait, the waiting list. Well, that just shows how popular that is. Plus the, the level of other machinery there, that um, other race, one of the categories with all the Brabham's in it. I don't think yeah, there, there would have been about 10, 12 Brabham's PQ, in the race. Yeah, uh, M&O, I think that was. Yeah, fabulous. There was, um, yeah, there's quite a few Brabham's. I don't know exactly how many. No, there's, there's quite good. Everywhere you look, there seemed to be one. And in, in pristine condition, I actually saw one there on the weekend that um, raced back in 1967 when I was there as a kid. It's still got the Jackie Stewart... Uh, name under it's been sticking over with the Brabham name, but uh, he said that's the car that raced here in the Tasman series all those years ago. And for aficionados and people that love motorsport, it's well worth it. And we looked at some of the uh, categories like here the, the Lola, uh, the Beach was part of me. Um, these are you know, there's such a uh, vast difference in the categories from going way back into the 50s, even early with the Maserati. And, uh, things that were there being on show right through to these ones. Uh, there's another Brabham at the Irish Racing Cars. That was in your next door to your pit, I think, wasn't it? Or very close to it, the um, Brabham? Yes, there was. There's two of them. Sean Whelan's got one and Andrew... can't remember his last name. He's got one as well. Yeah, they're, oh, well, there you go. They're all around the place, yeah. the uh, Repco Brabhams. And uh, we managed to get the uh, the clothing off one of them to have a look at up close up. And they're still a very strong and well-maintained machine. Yeah, the great thing about historics is how they raced in their in their days, how they're racing right now. So it's a great display of how they were doing things back then. And they don't muck about either. It's not as if they're out there for a parade lap having a look around. It, uh, they look like they're straight off the showroom floor and they're <clears throat> going to go back onto the showroom floor. But mate, when they get them out on the track um, and the sound, particularly the Formula 5000s and that Formula 1 
Ferrari of uh, Belgiorno Nettis that was uh, on display. Or oh, he was having a bit of a dip. That loud that he actually um, got the wrath of the officials once for yes, uh, yeah, he exceeding the DB limit. Yeah, him and Tom Tweedy <coughs> in that race are just both fabulous to watch. Oh, yeah, and the speeds he was getting around there and a, a guy that's a once a year racer. Um, getting around there in a time of 1 minute 30. So I got him 1 minute 30 and 1 minute 29. And uh, that's what superbikes are doing. That's what V8 supercars yeah. are doing. And yep. uh, pretty not too shabby on the accelerator, yep. that's for Tom sure. There. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's great to see. And, um, well, what was great to see too was the fact that um, Larry Perkins was the patron of the event. And part and parcel, that was a very special occasion. We were... Uh, he bought back his 2003 went Bathurst winning car. Uh, son Jack restored it completely, and it's a quite an interesting story of what they had to go through to bring it back to its original form. So take a look at this uh, as we had a chat with uh, Jack Perkins. Well, Jack Perkins, um, this Island Classic, it looks like it's getting bigger than most uh, mainstream race meetings. Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic event, and it has been for a number of years. Obviously, the week before the Grand Prix, it helps attract a lot of international guests and cars, and... Uh, just the amount of people that come down and really enjoy their historic racing. It's a credit to the VHRR and Ian Tate for putting on such a wonderful event. And um, normally the weather's supposed to be pretty good this time of year in Phillip Island, but as we know, that can uh, do anything. But uh, yeah, we're, and obviously this year we're very proud to have one of our own cars here participating. Yeah, um, so how many, first up, how many years have you been coming here to this event? Because now it's into its 31st year. Yeah, so I've been coming for the last sort of four or five years, um, with, with probably even more than that, to be honest. The last 10 years, just come in and have a look. Dad's been involved as a patron of the event for a few years as well. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's certainly um, an event that I've enjoyed coming to look at the cars and more so now as some of these cars that I've raced have become historics as well, um, it makes it quite neat. So, um, you know, and being at Phillip Island, it's obviously a historical uh, track my grandpa raced here in the 50s when the circuit was first opened and then obviously dad raced here and now I've raced here as well it's a it's a really cool part of Australian motorsport it is it's one of the best tracks in the world actually whether what whatever form of motorsport you're into yeah it is it's um you know, it's just a brilliant circuit well maintained by the uh, Lynn Fox group and the family they do a, a great job and without circuits like this in Australia we don't have anywhere to play so it's a credit to the family for keeping such a well-maintained venue and, 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 a, and a great to allow them to put on events like this um, along with World Superbikes and MotoGP it's um, you know it's obviously cool to be standing here in the garages where Valentino Rossi's probably been standing as well but um, obviously it's just really cool to be down here and it's great to see all these competitors. Yeah and now well competitors you need the uh, machinery to go with the competitors so talk us through this old beast. Yeah, this is a 2003 Bathurst car for my old man. He finished fourth in it. It was his last competitive race at Bathurst. And we actually set about the restoration of this car in 2012. Eight years later, we finally finished the project, and it's been restored to exactly how it was on the grid of Bathurst at the Bathurst day in 2003 when Dad had his last race. So all the original paint scheme on the car, all the original mechanicals are on the car. And uh, for Dad to have his first drive of the car, uh, in practice at this event, first time he's driven it since 2003, uh, was re really cool. So um, a lot of blood, sweat and tears have gone into the restoration and um, yeah, it's been a, been a proud project of ours to do and it's great to bring it down here and let Dad have a bit of fun. A bit emotional for him? Oh, look, it might be, you'd probably have to ask him, but you know, a little bit for me because I put so much time and effort into the restoration. Um, but we're very proud of how it's come up. A lot of people don't do proper restorations in the sense that they make them look good on the outside, but the inside might not be true to form. But we've gone through every nut and bolt, making sure that everything's still original and mechanically sound, paint jobs correct, and uh, the seats, all the ergonomics, fuel tanks, everything's all as it was in 2003. And uh, that's what we're proud of, is, uh, is our attention to detail. Well, 17 years, how much uh, deterioration had gone through? Has it been well looked after that there was just more of a, a fine tune to bring up the speed, or was it a complete uh, every bolt, every nut being uh, pulled out and serviced? It's not an easy question to answer, to be honest, because um, in that period of supercars, 2003 up to, say, 2010, uh, there was a lot of evolution with the cars. Uh, engineering started to play a more important role. So this car was the first car that Perkins Engineering designed using CAD software. So all of a sudden you've gone from, you know, cars that had a lot of input from mechanics to now a lot more input from engineers and they're the blokes that never work on the cars, so they're quite complicated to work on. But through the next few years from when the car was built, it went through a lot of evolution, engine, airbox, suspension, um, roll cage stiffness. So 
we had to do a lot, a lot of work to put the car back. We had to put bars back in, in the roll cage. We had to rejig certain things. It was a VZ Commodore. We needed to put it back to a VY Commodore. Um, lots of different things with the ECU wiring in the engine and the chassis and um, just lots of little things that add up to what's been an eight-year project. It's not very often you've got to go back in time to restore a car. Yeah, and to be honest, it's actually harder than building it from new. You know, the build of this car during 2003 might have only been two or three months. But, you know, we're not, admittedly, we haven't been full time, but it's still been a lot of work to go back in time because when you're putting something back to how it was, it's a lot different to building something from scratch. So, yeah, it's, um, it's been very, very methodical and, um, it's yeah, like I said, taken a lot of time just to make sure we did all the right things and kept the attention to detail. Um, it's very mechanically sound, so a lot of people think you're putting old bolts in it, which is not true, but we tried to keep the car as original as possible. We replaced things that needed replacing, but if the original components didn't need replacing, we kept them in the car as well. So things like that, um, like, like I said, just really proud of what we were being able to put on the track. I bet you have been. It'd be good to see it out there. So are you going to get a steer after all the work you put in, or the, uh, Larry's going to be keeping hold of that steering wheel pretty tight? Yeah, I don't think I'm going to get him out of the driver's seat, actually. Um, now, I, I was lucky enough to give it a quick shake down at Sandown before the event to make sure it was all good. And uh, now Dad's, you know, participating in the event and I'm, I'm happy to watch it go around and around. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people commented on how good it looks and how good it sounds. And um, it's uh, all that sort of stuff I'm, I'm very proud of. I don't need to drive it. That, Dad drove it in, in its day and he can, can drive it, you know, moving forward. I think you'll drive it pretty hard this weekend. Thanks for joining us, Jack. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, an interesting story about how that <clears throat> went back to the original, how many modifications it had over the course of the years to keep it um, competitive. And like you said, probably harder to take it back to what it was than building a new race car because you're trying to find out what it was actually on it all, the, all those years back then. Mm, absolutely. So it was um, great to see and great out on track too. Um, he did a couple of, well, he did a lot of demo laps in it and raced it as well. And... Uh, Typically, he raced it as hard as he could, and um, Jack is a really nice guy to talk to, very approachable. That's one thing I did notice down there over the weekend. Not only Jack but, uh, and Larry, but also Jim Richards, John Bowers down there, Greg Murphy. They're um, always open to people coming and having a chat, and uh, people more reticent about going in. I think at times the guys were saying, come in, and if you want to have a look, come in and have a look. It's that sort of meeting to go and have a really good uh, sticky beak at some marvellous bits of engineering, both Australian and from overseas. Yeah, no, they're great. They, the guys are really good. Every time I saw them, they're always very um, talking to people, talking with kids, giving autographs, putting the kids in the car. Um, that's the great thing about that meeting is that we like to encourage everyone to come up and, and get up and get personal with us and look at the cars. It's great. How much have you, um, have you seen it change over the years since you've been... I know, like they, um, Ian said, Penwright's been a part of it for since the very uh, yeah, beginning. But, yeah, about 26 um, years, I think, or 27 yeah, so, years. So how much change have you seen from then? From It sounds like, from what Ian was saying, it was basically just a clubber meeting that's grown yes, out of hand. and a lot of international drivers come over, um, again, because it's, it is before the Grand Prix, but just the, the, the amount of cars that come overseas, the, the, the level of cars that are coming over here, I mean, that circuit is just magic to drive <laughs> around. And there's nowhere else you can drive when you're heading down towards the sea. And when the weather is good, it's it's great. When it's challenging, it's it's challenging. That's but you know, part of the, that's, it's probably that's why they built the when Lukey built the track like where it was yeah. way back then, because he knew being living there, he would have known what a challenge it was to uh, build the track there. For yeah. the, and it's been, and it's one of the few tracks in the world that's actually maintained its most of its layout. It's had a slight change when they built the Grand Prix for the Grand Prix in '89, when they shortened turn four a little bit. But other than that, yeah. it's um, like they designed it and then they stood in a, a cow paddock all those years ago yeah. and let's put a track in. And as Jack said, Lindsay's done lots of um, the, lots of um, modification, uh, lots of improvements to it and kept it really safe for all the drivers. So there's plenty of runoffs, apart from when the grass gets a bit slippery and wet. <laughs> there's not much we can do about that, but there's plenty of kitty litter and there's plenty of runoff and they've certainly done a marvellous job of maintaining that track and making it look yeah, as wonderful as it does. Yeah, and here's an example of the, the yeah. size of the fields in it and the, yeah. diff the variety of uh, cars in it, from Alphas to old Ford Capris to the Mustangs. Um, there's still one of my favourite cars here, oh, the 67 and 1970 uh, Mustangs and the HOs. 
and watching this race from Siberia on Friday afternoon, the understeer of these uh, Camaros and uh, Monaros and also the, oh, there's a bit of a, yep. a slide there. It's Ivana getting you in the wrong spot, oh, doing yep. the 360. Yeah, just pirouettes, lovely. Yeah, yep. getting out of the way though. No, uh, nothing untoward, but <laughs> mate, fields of, you know, 50, 50 at least entries. Mini Coopers, that old Citroen there as well, the Renault as well. There was one up there, the old Slant 6 bit, uh, Valiant. Bits and pieces for everything. And uh, I'd hate to try and put a monetary value on what was on display down there and what was being mm. raced over the course of the weekend. It was just... And, you'd th and it's good to see, like, they were out there and they're racing and they're, like, as if it's going to be their last race ever. But they'll come back, they'll regroup. But the next big one's at Winton in a few months' time. Yeah, we're uh, short track Winton's the end of May. Yeah. You know, as my dad always said, he said, you know, these cars are made for racing. They're not made to be locked up in cotton wool. They're out to do what cars do, and that's race. And I saw, like, the Ford GG40 backing it into the fence at the hay shed early on Friday morning. And uh, yeah. A couple of other Brabham's coming back with a broken nose and things like that. It was only a thing. Ah, but it's only five, they said, it's only five glass, mate. At least the chassis hasn't been damaged, so yeah, we'll get it and out no, there. No one was injured, which is great. True, yeah. yeah, and that's another good thing about Phillip Island Racetrack. It's uh, got plenty of runoff and plenty of safety features. Yeah, although when I came round in my first race and the Delro Jag was uh, into the wall on coming out of turn 12. <laughs> one lap The down. driver, yeah, not yeah. even one lap, and I was, oh, he, the driver was a bit worried. Cause well, he did, it he, was a pretty fair hit, right, oh, at turn, the exit And he was slouched over, and I was like, oh. But he was okay. Car, yeah. The car wasn't, but he was. No, the car wasn't, but oh. he was. But yeah, it just shows the good thing about the safety features and uh, the rest of it. Here. And, and one other good thing too, the medical team were right on the scene with every incident down there on the weekend. Oh, they were quick. Mm. They needed to be. <laughs> yeah, that's true, because there was a lot, <laughs> part of me, there was a lot happening over the course of the three days. The guys getting uh, a little bit overexcited at times, but thankfully everybody was... Uh, uh, brought home safe and well and with a big smile on their face. And one that did have a big smile on his face we'll catch up with now is Larry Perkins. Larry Perkins, well, this would be a step back in time, wouldn't it? You've been a patron and you've been on and off over the years, but to be the patron and competing in your, one of your old um, cars must be pretty good, feeling pretty good. Yeah, it is, and uh, it certainly brings back memories, no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, a patron is something you never think about when you're busy doing all this. But now, 20, 20 years on, I think, hey, that's not bad being patron and indeed having the car here, which Jack's done a fantastic job of restoring and having a little fang around, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, you told me a bit about what you've done and it's like uh, having to take your car back in time to restore it to its an original. Normally you're trying to bring it up to date, but with everything, all the mods that have happened over that, and it just shows how durable and reliable these old Commodores were. Well, he's restored it to us. I had it on the grid at Bathurst 2003, which was my last race. Uh, that was a long time ago, and uh, you know, it feels exactly the same. My, my driving suit still fits, and uh, I did four or five laps yesterday, and uh, I thought, you know, I can, I, I can feel all the enthusiasm that I used to have, and uh, uh, yeah, it was great. Now, well, you've got a bit of history here yourself. Um, three generations of racing here over the years. Have you got any major standouts about competing at the best racetrack in the world? Oh, Phillip Island for years has been right up there with the best racetracks it's it's got a great layout uh you know over the, uh, the hill there in the mg high speed corners onto the straight and the end of the straight it's a fantastic track and it goes back many years as you would know uh, i don't know when they first raced here but it's an awful long time ago and my dad used to race here in, a, in an open wheeler car he made he he raced in the first 500 mile race here in a volkswagen in 62 and uh yeah, so we've got a lot of history. You wouldn't have much choice about in, um, not getting into motor racing, would you? <laughs> no, but I can remember when it was way back coming here when I was only, must have been five or six with Dad, and uh, the, the, I remember the toilet block was just a hessian wrapped around some sticks, and I'll, for some reason I've never forgotten that. So, yep, the current owners have certainly lift the, lifted the game of it, and it, it's a great venue. Are you nostalgic for the old days when you see the way modern racing's going? Or gone? Well, I, I don't think I'm nostalgic, except when I go back as I am here today having a look, I just think this is... What, what I think is amazing is the enthusiasm from hundreds of individuals, whether it be owners, mechanics, or people who were around then. And, you know, the, 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 it's an era that was loved by many. And, uh, 
Uh, I can see why, and I don't try to compare it with modern racing because it's, it's not comparable. And uh, this is what it was then, and uh, whether it be my era 20 years ago, but I mean, I'm seeing cars here that are much older than I am. And, uh, you know, the, the, the race cars are you know, lovingly cared for by individuals, and I think that's fantastic. I think the crowds are resp uh, reflecting that because of the, the interest in these older machines that, um, you know, the, the old BT Brabham's and all that that are there, the Elfin Sports cars, the Formula 5000s, um, and it's bringing out a lot of, notice even now today, there's a, a lot of young people coming along with their granddads or parents have a look as well. Yes, that's right. See, the difference with today, uh, today's show is more about, oh, we've got to make it good for TV and yeah, blah, blah. Back and, and now for old cars, it's, hey, this is what our act is. It's old stuff. You either like it or you don't like it. And uh, a lot of people like it, and I think it's fantastic. Will you be driving it like you stole it? <laughs> I'll be driving it so that I make sure I drive it back into pit lane and hand it back to Jack. He'll be mad at me if I put it off the road. So uh, I'll be... Uh, I'll be having a little bit of reserve there, I promise you. I'd like to talk to you afterwards um, about when went your first time on a grid for that 17 years and the buzz and the butterflies and everything that you, you've forgotten about until you get back in the car. That's true, you do forget about some things, but when I hop in the car now, the seating position, everything is so familiar because, as I say, I've got the same driving suit, all that fits, everything feels so familiar. Uh, yeah, and I, can, I sort of see why I used to do it for so many years. I loved it, but... Yeah, when I retired, I thought, well, I'm moving on and doing something else. And uh, But, you know, those feelings don't go away. Well, looking forward to seeing you roll the years back, mate, and uh, get that adrenaline buzz again. Well done, Larry Perkins. Thank you very much. Yeah, well done, Larry Perkins, for getting out there and having a dip. And uh, I did have a quick chat to him after, during the course of the weekend, and he actually said you'd forgotten what that rush was like on a grid. And uh, I think that's what keeps people coming back and... As he said then, he said, I'm glad I didn't get back into racing. I just walked away from it because if I got back into it sooner, maybe I never walked away from it. So, um, And anybody that sat on a grid of a, a race, a go-kart race, a junior race or a car race, bike race or whatever, um, that is, 90, I think, not 90%, but it is a lot of what um, drags you back each time to go racing. Oh, yeah, it's absolutely adrenaline. It's great. Apart from when you miss the start, <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is great. Well, tell us about that. You weren't too popular with your... Uh, they, with your crew on the weekend? No, afternoon. Saturday afternoon. No, I was, I was so intent on getting my RPM right that I was too focused on just looking up and looking down just to the eye movement. And of course, uh, I looked down once too many times and I looked up and everyone was going <laughs> apart from me. The rest of yeah. the field was gone. Yeah. And how hard is it to get past those people out there? Because they'd be pretty, the way the classes have combined, the lap times and the speeds are pretty even, no matter what the, the age of the vehicles. Yeah, well, because I had such a terrible qualifier because it was that wet morning and um, we got one, I did one site, this was a site lap and then by the time I come around for the next lap, I still couldn't find any grip anywhere and had a little visit around Siberia. I went to have a look at the inside of the track there. Seeing and if they mown the grass, that's yep, what I yep, was, They didn't. Um, no, they did. Um, but then I, and then of course, then once I actually could get going, I, I went up and, and when I got to the hay shed, I had noticed another car into the wall. And so that was our qualified done. So I didn't even really get two laps in. So I think out of 46 cars, I qualified 38th, which certainly wasn't one of my best. And um, and then so I had to spend the next couple of races trying to make my way up the grid. And uh, on Sunday afternoon, I finished fifth, which was great. That was pretty good. And you've got a good way of going through the field. I did look at you over the course of the weekend. And you're not scared of sticking your nose in, so to speak. <laughs> no, the car is fabulous on the brakes. And I have yeah. to use that because it is a, it's a horsepower track. And it's something that the little Lola lacks. But um, she can make up for it in, in other areas. So I was going to make sure... I can use her to the best of her advantage and it's certainly going out of Siberia down through Lukey Heights and all those other places where those big heavier cars have take a little bit longer to pull up or as I can just sort of keep sliding in and they're just always too busy just watching me in their mirrors and uh, waiting for them to make a mistake. Are you going to get into any other cars or would you, would you stick with the Lola and get to um, have another drive of a few things? Cause I looked at your, um, well, saw you looking at that Brabham enviously that was in your, the Penrite garage. Yeah, well. BT16. Yeah, the trouble is, is um, I'm only five foot one. Um, and to, for me to fit in the Brabham, the pedals would have to come that far to me that we just the boys can't physically do it and the seat would have to be fully 
I would have to just make me a new mould and shift me forward, and it just wouldn't. We've tr we've You've tried. We've it. tried, and uh, unfortunately, you've tried every avenue, work. haven't you? Yep. So, uh, I could probably jump back in a Formula Ford if I want to. Um, Not the same buzz as racing the Lola, though. No. Well, the Lola is such a precious car to us. It was, um, it's, you know, it's, it's it's got a lot of history to it. Um, tell us a bit of the history then. Oh, was it that particular car being only 27 um, Mark One Lolas are made, and we've got the number 24. So that particular, and then the number 24 chassis won the 1961 Johor Grand Prix, uh, and the 1962, um, and then it's come out um, to Australia. Dad brought it in the early 90s, and then my brother Mark raced it for a, for a long period of time, and, and then we've had Keith Simpson drive it as well, and then my brother-in-law Ken um, drove it as well, and then they put me in it probably about 10 years ago, and the car and I have just clicked, and we're doing fabulous. So how many you'll be doing about another three or four meetings during the year, won't you? you yeah, the four. Yeah, yeah, we've got the short track, long track. Uh, we will do sand down and then we're looking up. Uh, we're going to go to Eastern Creek as well. Okay, so and that's later, that's like in November, isn't it? Yeah, that's a, a last weekend in November or something. Well, we'll be putting those dates up on the uh, the uh, what's coming up screen at the end of the show so you'll be able to catch up with a couple of historic meetings wherever you are around the countryside. And if you've got any meetings out there that you want us to put up there, send it in to us at uh, even use my email address, mark at letstalkmotorsports.com.au. And um, we'll let everybody know about the meeting. But before we leave Phillip Island, let's just have a little quick chat with Jimmy Richards, who's, uh, well, he partnered Perkins in that uh, 2003 Bathurst race. Well, Jim Richards, um, you'd have to be one of the luckiest so-and-sos I know because you get to drive so many different cars and you keep on smiling you're still fast at, at, at not a young age. Well, I suppose. I mean, you don't, um, you know, forget how to drive, but uh, you're obviously not as fast as you used to be, although you'd like to think you were, but you're not, I can assure you. Uh, but I just enjoy driving the cars. I mean, the results nowadays don't matter. Uh, and in Group C and Group A, of course, they're all combined, so you've got a lot, lot of more modern cars. So we really run the little BM because it's a beautiful car and uh, spectators like the look of it. Oh, well, spectators, I think classic racing in cars and bikes is going through a real resurgence because of the fact that these cars are unobtained in these days, especially some of the other ones you see up and down pit lane, and the fact that it's going back to what racing used to be, I suppose. No, that's right. I mean, these car, all these cars in the Group A and the Group C class are cars that raced in the day. So you can't just build a car. You have to have a car that raced in the day and you have to prove it. So it's, uh, it keeps the cars, you could say, uh, uh, at a reasonable level of cost. But uh, if, if someone wants to come and race in the class, they've got to buy a car or someone who's already there type of thing. So when was the last time you drove this? Uh, three weeks ago in New Zealand. Oh, OK. So you've been, you're doing a lot of um, classic racing in it, so it would be like an old glove now, wouldn't it? No, pretty well. I, I don't do a lot. I do um, one or maybe two meetings in Australia and one or two in New Zealand. But, uh, but other than that, I don't do any, any, any racing at all. What about um, coming around back to Phillip Island for how long since you've had a steer around here? Last year, I presume? Last year, yeah. yeah and yeah. this is one track that keeps you coming back for more and more as well. Oh, well, it's a good, probably the best, um, you could say, the best classic event in the country. So it's always good to be here. All right, mate. Well, all the best and um, look forward to seeing you out on track. Pleasure. Thank you. Well, Jimmy summed it up by saying it's probably the best classic meeting in the country. And I think that goes about everybody that competes there and uh, the level of competition. I'm, I'm looking forward to it again next year. Probably even get out to another classic, a couple of classic meetings up in the, the countryside and see what they're like on tighter racetracks too. Because I reckon the competition would just be as, as intense as, uh, probably more intense than what it was at Phillip Island because the, the speed of the track everybody sp starts to spread out a little bit. Yeah, I think, and that's what happened, that's what caught a few people out on Friday, is that everyone forgets how fast Phillip <laughs> Island is, and uh, add a little bit of uh, water and a bit of oil to that, it makes it very uh, challenging and exciting. So the future of classic racing in good hands, there's plenty of people interested in it to keep the, keep the flag, flying the flag? I think so, when you, when you go down and see it on the weekend as it was, I think there's, there's plenty of interest. Uh, it would be nice to get some younger drivers um, replacing some of the older ones, but I'm sure that will happen in time, and it just be encouraging the the older generation to um, get some of the younger generation in and give them a go as well. But 
You know, also, so there was a good demographic. Of, obviously, there was a lot of older people and older competitors, mm. but there was still a good demographic of younger generation turning up and uh, not just looking as if they were interested, but actually ogling the machinery. Yeah, I mean, we've got young Declan Fu who drives our um, Elfin Clubman, and he's only 17. Um, and he's, he's, he's going great guns and we'll put him in the Formula Ford for Winton and he's doing everything right and he's, he's, uh, he's becoming a very good little steerer. Well, it could be a good entry level for people that are interested. Uh, join the HRRR, HVRR, VHRR, join the Racing Register. And if you're interested, if you're a youngster, you want to get into a bit of racing and just find out what it's about, I'd be contacting Ian Tate and the crew at the VHRR and see what we can do because it might even be a vacancy for me as well. So, but no, it was a great meeting and. Before we go on, I will, we've got a little bit more of Classic, but we'll go back to the Island Classic from uh, January, Australia Day weekend, when we caught up with one of our American uh, visitors who was a um, pretty entertaining interview with Larry Pegram. Well, now we've got the fun out of the way. Larry yeah. Pegram, welcome back to Australia. Yeah, how you doing, mate? <laughs> Bloody good. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I'm having fun. I don't know what... I knew it was uh, time for my practice because it started raining. So I didn't even, uh, you know, I don't know what you guys are doing with the weather here, but you got to fix it. Mate, we've had some really wild weather at the moment, as you can tell, you know, uh, with the bushfires and yeah. the rain and the dust storms. Well, and you need the rain, so I'm glad you guys are getting the rain. Not good for riding, but great for you guys. Uh, and uh, what well, did it take you much convincing to come back again for another visit? No, last year, you know, I didn't know what to expect and kind of came here not knowing and then had such a great time and enjoyed it so much I knew I was coming back after the first day. Even more determined I suppose being the typical racer? No I don't care if I win or lose you know I'm just here to you know have fun. <laughs> <laughs> what a load of it eh? You know probably on the last lap if I was racing with somebody I'd probably just let them. Yeah win. I'm sure yeah I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't. I don't. I'm not a competitive person by nature you know. Uh, this is a comedy show at the moment too I think. But uh, no, it is a good place here on Phillip Island on a dry track. Yeah. And then the weather's not too bad either. Yeah, the, you know, the only problem with this place when it's wet, it's usually 50 mile an hour wind at the same time. So it's, it's, it's my favorite track in the world. That's what got me here last year. I didn't know anything about this event. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and then came last year, I had a great time and uh, kind of did all my own wrenching last year which, you know, that's a risk in itself. So I brought in my, my old crew chief, Dave Weaver, who has been with me for pretty much my whole life and, um, you know, try to be a little bit more serious, but still remember to have fun because that's what this thing's about is having a good time. And, and uh, you know, I always tell my kids it's, it's fun. Remember to make sure it's fun, but you know how to make it more fun. Go ahead and win. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. And were you surprised with, I've been saying this to everybody, were you surprised, because it reminds me of Colin Edwards, when he came out here a couple of years ago, he's just shaking his head. Yeah. He couldn't believe the competitiveness and how she, like, we all joke and have fun off the track, but once it goes out there and it's uh, the, red, the red lights go out. Yeah, yeah you know, I think it, it, it's, you know, everybody that's racing here is either, you know, former champions or really good riders that are up towards the front end of this thing. So course you know like i said we could have a ping pong match or we could go get on the go-karts and it's going to get serious <laughs> this, is, this is the way it is but you know our group and the mojo yamaha group dave and larry they did a good job this you know what i call our off season which is a whole year between these races of improving our bikes and i think getting us you know on par or, or maybe even better than everybody else i'm really happy with my bike and uh we've only got one practice so far but it's a big improvement over what we had here last year so i think we might uh, surprise some guys I hope so. I reckon it's good. It's um, Well, Josh went away from here very close to taking the overall, and if it hadn't been for that incident in the third leg, I think he would have won the overall as well. And he's come back, you've come back more determined. And, uh, I think it's just great for the category, and hopefully the uh, the English can get their build it up again. They're going through a bit of a, a re regeneration at the moment. But within a couple of years, they'll be back there as well. Yeah, it would be cool if we keep growing this thing. You know what I mean? And, and maybe get some Italians and some Spanish and English and... You know, the Irish need to be on their own. You can't really mix the English and the Irish. I mean, that's what I'm told. I don't know. I'm no political there. But, you know, I think it would be cool to really get everybody here. I think this could be one of the, you know, in Ohio, they have a, we have a racetrack called Mid-Ohio. And the big, one of the biggest weekends they have, bar none, for the whole racetrack is the Vintage Weekend. So it's, it's, it's really cool that, to see this stuff. And, and um, 
I think this could be one of those type of events where it's one of the biggest weekends for the whole track. Well, we could have a home in Hawaii. Yeah, we could do one in mid-Ohio too. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do during uh, the 12 months? For your, your, what training do you do in 12 months to come here? Do you do much coaching? Do you still keep your eye on? Well, I've been, I did a bunch of flat track races last year, you know, so I, I came to this one and got me a little bit motivated. So I started doing some of the American flat track series and I was going to do one or two of them and ended up doing nine. So <laughs> I ended up, and then this year I'm going to do 12. So there's 18 races and I'm doing 12 of them. I'm riding on a, on a factory Indian. So I did pretty good last year and uh, didn't win any races, but got up in the top five. So I'm 47. The next oldest guy, I think, is like 33 in the series. So I won a couple of the preliminary races and, let, you know, run up front in the main. So it was it was fun. I wasn't in great shape. So I'm working harder this year to get in a little better shape. But I'm still trying to remember to have fun because that's why I'm doing it. But uh, And then I grow weed. So, uh, you know, uh, I never thought I'd do that. It's legal. Well, there's a lot of money. Isn't yeah, it? there is. It's legal in the state of Ohio where I live. It's medically legal. And, and I went um, three years ago went out for a license it was a competitive process and got one and so we've been growing medical cannabis in Ohio we have a company called pure Ohio wellness and that's that that takes up too much of my time you know I, I, I have a real job so to speak which you know I've never had in my life I race motorcycles my whole life so uh, it's interesting it's fun but it's still not racing motorcycles yeah. and speaking motorcycle with the, the Indians they've really come back big and strong haven't they yeah you know Indian is basically owned by Polaris so they Indian kind of had a few reincarnations in the past and they were pretty weak but this one's really strong and the company's doing well they're selling a lot of motorcycles and their flat track bikes the best one out there so you know when I had the opportunity to ride one of their bikes last year I was really honored by it and then did pretty well so they they got me one for this year too and I'd like the, the Springfield mile is one of my bucket list jobs to go and have a look at that. You guys doing 120 mile an hour average laps and things like that. Yeah. It's just complete. And I'd, you see all the videos of it, but there's nothing that you'd have to yeah, be there. It doesn't there. give it justice until you go basically stand on the inside of the guardrail and turn one, you know, on the first lap of the race. And you go, OK, that just got real. <laughs> well, if we come over, you'll have to get me yeah. on the inside. There. We, we went to Indy, uh, the Indy mile, and it's the same similar track to Springfield. And Rossi was there when they did the Indianapolis race. and. He was going to ride. That's when he was racing for Ducati, and I was uh, I had a Ducati flat track bike, so he was going to take it out and ride it. And <laughs> he went to turn one for the first practice, and he walked to me. He looked at me. He goes, "No, nah, ain't happening. I am not going out." <laughs> He's like, "There's no way." Nikki actually ended up riding that bike that night, and and uh, and I think Kenny went out on his old yeah. TZ 750. So it was a really neat night. And uh, but uh, the flat track stuff is cool. It, it is. It's fun. It's it's uh, it's what I grew up doing, and and so it's still. Uh, it's it's real similar to this, to be honest with you. You know, this vintage stuff. It you know when you get to the superbike level and you get to the the world superbike level or whatever, everybody's still friendly, but there's a there's a difference. And then when you step back to the flat track level, it's kind of like, hey, my bike broke. Oh well, we got we got a part for you over here. You never see that in a world superbike paddock or in a in a MotoGP paddock. And same thing here, even more so. It's like the dirt track crowd. It's like, oh, you you need this here. Take my wheel. You know, so. That's cool because that takes me back to when I rode as a kid, when I when I had fun and it was it was, you wanted to win but you wanted your buddy to line up next to you to try to try to beat you and see who was better that day. So, that's what I think makes this fun and and keeps everybody engaged. But you still want to win, you know. Well, hopefully you, we see you here for a few more years trying to win. Yeah, you know I don't know I'm getting old. They might not let me come here much longer. Well, they say a lot of riders are getting old, but one bloke 41 years he's at 41 years old next month. And he got the fastest lap record at uh, Malaysia at the Malaysian Grand Prix, Rossi or whatever his name is. Yeah, he, you know, he, he's he's not as old as me though. I'm 47 now, so I know I enjoy it. And 47 body, but still 21. Oh yeah, I know. I, I I I had a guy, I don't know how many years ago it was. Got it probably 20 years ago. I was racing for Ducati, and I was doing an autograph signing at a at a um, motorcycle dealership for Ducati, and an older guy came up to me at the time. He was older. He's probably 50, and he said, Hey. I was probably I was probably 30, so maybe it was like 17 years ago. And he goes, "Hey, don't ever retire until you want to." He goes, "They're going to tell you you're old. They're going to tell you, you got to retire. Ride till you're 80 if you want to." And I thought it was just you know it was just some guy coming up to me while I'm signing autographs, and I just remember it kind of stuck with me because I still remember it now. So when I decided at the end of 15 to retire, I thought about it, and then I started riding again. I was like, you know what? I'm never going to retire. I am. I'm just going to keep riding. I'm not going to go full, you know, I'm not making my living racing. I'm not going at it full time. I'm only going to do events I want to, but I'm never going to totally retire. Well, it's the best way to be because I think um, it keeps your brain active and yeah. it does keep you young. And yeah. 
no matter what anybody says, whatever motorsport you do, there's nothing like the start grid of a, a motorcycle race. And I think that's what keeps a lot of guys going because that adrenaline rush on the grid, there's nothing, nothing yeah. like it. Yeah, there's nothing like going into the first corner, whether it be here or on a flat track race or whatever. It's, it's, I, you just can't explain unless you've done it. Exactly. And that, but that, yeah, the adrenaline buzz, it's uh, noisy, but quite so many things you talk about. But Larry Pegram, uh, welcome back to Australia. Good to see you again. And hopefully you keep that passion going for a lot of years and keep coming back in. All right. Thanks. No worries, mate. Right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, Larry Pegram, quite a character. Never won an AMA championship, won a lot of races, uh, won a lot of dirt track races as well. But um, as he said, age shall not weary them. 47 years old and he's still doing dirt track. And as he said, growing weed. <laughs> One of the classic lines of interviewing I've ever done to have that thrown at you is, uh, in the middle of a conversation. And um, But it's all legal and all the rest of it. But spent $10 million in, in building that business up. He was telling me off camera after that event. And so... Uh, but he'll keep racing, he'll come out there, and it just shows you whether it's um, these guys at the Island Classic, it's that same passion, the same nostalgia buzz to come out and get on the older bikes and have a bit of a black round. And Well, he started dirt tracking again because of it, and like he said, he's got another 12 meetings for it this year, and doing crazy stuff on an Indian, doing over 100 mile an hour laps. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Crazy. That's the best. I've got it. That is on the bucket list to go to um, the Springfield Mile or the Indy Mile and see it on the dirt and then just throwing them sideways at... Yeah. Uh, at incredible speeds and incredible angles and incredibly close too, bar to bar, basically. And on the straight, you see them, they've actually got one hand on the fork leg and one hand on the throttle, ducking down to get better aerodynamics out of it. But uh, a great character, Larry Pegram, one of the many that is in uh, motorsport. We'll catch up with a few more guys from the uh, Island Classic in weeks to come. But one guy that we'll catch up with now that um, maybe he could be still racing at 47. He's 34 years old now. This is part four of our excellent interview that we had with Johnny Ray on the eve of the opening round of the uh, World Superbike Championship at Phillip Island. So stick with us for this last bit before we come back and wrap up another show of Let's Talk Motorsport. Now going back a little bit, in your book Dream, Believe, Achieve, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that for all the world championships you'd had, you'd give it up for one motocross world championship. Um, is it, have I taken that out of context in a way? Uh... No, yes and no. I think the five world championships paid for a really nice life of mine now. I mean, I've got my dream home and life's pretty set up. So the one motocross championship probably wouldn't put me on my feet like that, but <laughs> I'd, I'm sure I'd have but a hell of a lot more fun. You know, yeah. Is it because that every lap's different on a motocross bike, whereas in a... No, I think I grew up in motocross with yeah. that dream, and it was a bloody hard sport. You know, it's ridiculous. So, um, but then the reality of... You know, I just come done my motocross camp in Spain. Uh, it's become a bit of a routine now before the start of the year. Riding every day and you do what, 13, I don't know how many races they have now, maybe 16 rounds yeah. of the World Championship. Most of the guys are doing a domestic championship as well. They're riding two to three times a week. They're, they're pretty done by, you know, late 20s. Then if you go to the US, you've got a full Supercross season. You've got a month of you know, a few weeks off and it's a motocross season and a month off before you start supercross riding. I think SBK has got the best balance of, uh, certainly for me being a family guy now, that work-life balance is perfect. So um, I wouldn't change it for a thing. And I think road, the road race guys won't like this, but road racing is much easier than motocross. Well, I've said a few other people say that to me. It's a, it's a brutally hard sport yeah. and I think uh, the next champions are always coming from motocross. If I could go and pick a young kid now as a, a mentorship, I'd go to the motocross paddock and pick a 14-year-old kid with talent and say, mate, you're wasting your time here. The, the likelihood of making it's uh, 0% or like half a percent, but yep. you've, got a, you've got the minerals to go to road racing. And uh, that'd be a cool project to do, maybe when I retire. Well, you, you never know. Yeah. Um, and while you're racing, you've had a, got a lot of good accolades, like MBE in tw 2016? Um, Sportsman of the Year awards, and it's very good to see that what is mo a minority sport when you look at the football and all the rest of the world, that you're getting the accolades probably, which is a more physical sport, a lot more dangerous sport, we know that, but that must be one of the very most satisfying things that you've had happen to you as well. Yeah, I think, in, um, especially in the UK, because motorsport, even MotoGP, is, uh, it's not a big sport at all. Um, it's on 
It's on pay to view TV. I think BT, BT Sport have MotoGP, Eurosport have World SBK. So you pick up your, your paper rounds on a Monday and you won't see who won MotoGP or Superbike. We're lucky in Northern Ireland because of the heritage there. It's a smaller country, of course, but with Joey Dunlop paving the way for guys like me, it's a national sport. So it, uh, I've been very lucky to be embraced by the Northern Irish public. But we don't enjoy the same um, exposures like South Europe, you know, Spain, yeah. Italy, where uh, these guys are household names, you know, even the mid packers, because, you know, the the journalists that follow the sport are, you know, they, they write about it. The circulation's massive, you know, the, the viewing attendance are massive. But um, I think it's something to do with the weather as well, you know, when you grow yeah. up and you're 16, no kid in the UK wants to get a scooter or a motorbike to go to work. They want to wait till they're 17 and have a car. Where in, you know, in Italy and Spain, it's all about, you know, that that's the way of life over there, motorcycles. So well, I think you've got to get a license for a scooter before you actually go for a car license in yeah. Spain. So it's uh, it's pretty. Um, I can see it, but I, I feel really good that, especially in the last years, being embraced now in Northern Ireland. You know, we've got a lot of sporting icons. You know, from uh, you know, currently, you know, guys like uh, Roy McIlroy, yeah. Graham McDowell in golf, Carl Frampton in boxing, uh, the Northern Ireland football team, and and now myself in in motorcycle. And it's you know, it's a great time for the country and. Um, I feel them on my back, you know, I feel all the support I get. What do you do to relax? Watch a movie and open a bottle of red wine <laughs> on a Friday night, you know, just uh, normal stuff. I don't, um, I don't tend to have too much downtime with the two kids, so yeah. I, I always enjoy hanging out with them. Um, but yeah, just uh, a relaxing time is just sitting at home, you know, and uh, getting the boys to bed and putting my feet up watching trashy crap TV. So with the, with the boys now in school in Northern Ireland, and you've obviously they're half Aussie with Tash and everything, um, you don't get the time to spend a lot of time in Australia. Uh, will you ever come out to settle here or is, you've got to be there for the next few years with the kids going to school? Well, no, I think it's open-ended. I think with the world being so accessible now, you can, we can be anywhere. I think the kids are enrolled in a local school anyway, here, in case, uh, in case that's the plan. Um, but I'm, we're so open-minded, you know, this sport, unfortunately as a rider, you can't dictate your career path. You just kind of go where opportunities go. And um, whilst I'm now at the peak of my career, um, I don't know which turns are coming next. So there might be a point where we revisit that. And I certainly wouldn't be opposed to coming out here. It's a cool place. I've got a lot of friends here as yeah. well. Well, you noticed that after a couple of victory laps. At, yeah, uh, and um, you know the local fellow Byland, you know, Tars grew up. They've embraced me as well as a sort of adopted citizen. And um, you know, the cult, I, lo I love the Aussie culture. You know, it's, the people here are really nice. And um, yeah, it's a wouldn't be a bad place to bring up a couple of crazy kids. Well, I know my local butcher's embraced you because he talks about you every time yeah. I go in there. All right. That's it. You'd get a lot of uh, yeah food cultures here. I love food. I'm a real foodie, and that's. Um, I think the Aussies are ahead of the rest of the world in food and uh, with a lot of Asian influence, which is nice. But um, yeah, we built a beautiful house there just off the golf course in cars. Well, that's handy for you. You like swinging the club. And um, yeah, who knows? Maybe in the future it'll be uh, somewhere we can settle down. Now, five championships, 88 wins, 168 podiums. Is there one championship, one race that stands? Can you remember all your wins? like and? I'll get back to the, what championship is your most satisfying? Or, or they're Certainly, all... Certainly um, 2015, the first championship, because I think everybody's first championships, they're the most memorable because you work your ass off to get there yeah. and you, have, you face your struggles, your hard times, and, and then suddenly you get the dream. That's, uh, that was amazing. You know, races sticking out, it's hard, you know. Um, I had a double in 2010 at Aston. It was a pretty nice weekend, my first ever double. In my second year in Superbike, I felt like that was awesome. Um, my Donington race weekend last year was yeah. cool because I won in the wet and the dry and did a triple uh, at a track that is not the most kind to me. Um, but yeah, I've, luckily I had so many good memories. So, uh, But also a few horrors too, you know, I, 
I spent um, a huge part of my early career injured. You know, I was a bit of a crasher when I was younger, and um, I had a few, but not just from my fault, but I had a few brake failures and things like that, which um, scary. I broke my leg and spent a lot of time in the hospital. But after that, you know, generally things have been pretty good. Well, that crashing was then. This is now, Jr. In the last few years, I think you've crashed. Four, you've had five mechanicals, two crashes in one in race, but one of those crashes wasn't even your fault. So you've turned it around as you've really gelled with the Kawasaki. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's things making mistakes, but then you keep making mistakes. That's not very good. So I think I was trying to learn from these experiences of the past. You know, I think uh, 2014 was a good year at Honda, you know, because I really understood the package I was on, and then it became about, okay, right, if I can finish sixth today, finish sixth. Don't try and crash finishing fourth. And I finished third in the world that year. Uh, something like 80 points behind Sylvain Ginterly. And that was an awesome year. I didn't win, but I felt like I, I really, that was the year that I knew I could start winning a championship, especially going to Kawasaki. So, um, yeah, I also think electronics nowadays are so sophisticated. They're preventing a lot of crashes, like prolonging people's careers. Um, so Alpine star bringing Tech Air airbag out now. You know, I crash, I've got an airbag, yeah. goes off. So there's lots of uh, reasons why now that. And also, you would have had to override the Honda because it wasn't the bot. Whereas the Kawasaki, you can you don't have to ride it as hard to get the results uh, as like the Honda. I disagree. Well, it's hard. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't disagree with that theory, but it's not completely accurate. Yeah. I. I still. I still go all in to win the races in the Cowie, but I think the the bike itself is just at a better level. So when you're throwing caution to the wind, the the feedback, everything is much better. You know, at, at Honda, I didn't have the brain to say, right, there's the limit. So maybe it was a bit my fault as well, Yeah. because I didn't understand the limit because of the bike. But um, yeah, experience just teaches that. And, you know, crashing hurts. <laughs> so, yeah, we know so that. Yeah. It's uh, after one or two big ones, you kind of you realise yeah. that hey, if I want to keep going at this, I need to sort myself out. You got the celebrating down, Pat. I take it, eh? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> we've had a few good ones. You know, I think. Uh, yeah, I think the best is probably we rented a huge villa in Marbella, at seventeen, and went there for two nights with. Uh, all the team there was I think there was twi about 20 of us in the end and uh, all the stories from the trip we had golf and going out and it was just amazing you know amazing group of guys and they live it with me you know I can see when I don't do well I can see the pain in their face as well because they want to win as badly as me yeah. but they're clever enough they've been in this world long enough to know how to react in all these different situations so just find a good group of guys and that's what that's what wins you at the end of the day. All right, mate. Thanks for joining us. And let's talk motorsport and yep. all the best for the year and many years to come. Cheers, man. Yeah, great ambassador for the sport. Great guy. Very forthright. That was a 40-minute interview we did. And as such, we had to split, split it up over 40 min, uh, four interviews or four segments. You might have noticed there was a bit of difference in the uh, audio with the rain. We had to stop at one stage for the rain, but then we just thought... Uh, well, we've just got to keep going. It was a typical summer Monday, uh, summer's afternoon in Melbourne uh, when that, uh, I think we got about 50 millimetres overnight that night. It was just before the um, dawn of the uh, superbike testing. So uh, that was a bit of the audio. But, mate, he's a very interesting guy, very humble. Um, he's very appreciative of how he's ended up. But like you said, he's learned a bit because crashing hurts. I like that comment. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll get more of him during the course of the year and more riders as well. Uh, before we go, we'll just uh, get up the events calendar coming up. There's a few events coming up around the, the countryside. And remember, if you've got any events you want us to put on air, send them in to us here at Let's Talk Motorsport and uh, we'll give you as much coverage as possible to try and get some people out to watch the events and get some people on the hills barracking for people um, out there having a bit of fun. So here's the upcoming events. We've got the Classic Cars at Collie uh, coming up in Western Australia and then the first round of the Terra Road Race Series in uh, 
Hidden Valley and Northern Territory at one of the best racetracks in Australia this weekend as well. Then uh, besides we've got the Formula One Grand Prix which everybody knows about. The Festival of Speed in Sydney, uh, more of a club orientated event this year than the international uh, theme that we've had in past years. That's the 20 to the 22nd of March. And um, then also on that weekend we've got uh, the uh, Classic Festival of Cars at the Autumn Classic Carnival down at Wakefield Park down near Goulburn. And then rounding off the month, we've got the uh, next round of the ASBK Round 2 at Wakefield Park, which will be an absolute cracker. They've been there the last two days. A lot of the teams have been testing from the Superbikes all the way through to the Oceana Junior Cup. Um, I don't believe who says who because they don't have any official t time in there at the moment. So it's all um, who strokes the biggest ego, I suppose, that's um, going to be there. But I know one thing at Wakefield Park in uh, a couple of weeks' time is going to be an absolute cracker. It turns it on every year. Hopefully the weather will stay this, uh, pretty good. We've had a couple of dust storms there in the past. Uh, the weather's been pretty good, but we've got sidecars here as well at Wakefield Park in a couple of weeks. And the uh, Motorcycling Australia, who uh, co-promote the series along with this uh, year, the My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship, We've got, uh, they've given us a heap of uh, vouchers to give away. There's your code to get into the ASBK website, asbk.com.au, to get a discount on your weekend pass, your Saturday pass or your Sunday pass. And during the next couple of weeks, if you've only got a Sunday pass, we'll have some uh, pit walk tickets to give away too. So you can go and uh, get up close and personal at uh, Wakefield Park, the Bend, also at Winton and uh, the final round at Phillip Island. So keep an eye out for that. We'll be doing things. Thank you again, Sam, for coming in and uh, putting up with me for another hour. Oh, yeah, thanks for having me. And giving us your views on it. And hopefully we can uh, get you and some more classic people back in from the cars in the near future, particularly in the lead up to and from uh, Winton and events during the course of the year. No problems. No worries. And uh, thanks to you for everybody for watching. Um, if you like this show, if you like this show, Tell all your friends and everybody else about it. If you don't like the show, tell us so we can do something about it to improve it. But until next week, I'm Mark Brack signing off at Let's Talk Motorsport. So in the meantime, talk motorsport.